Check this out. Cardio can actually build muscle. <laughs> I'm gonna hit you people do, from all you angles. Do it, you can't. You gotta do it over. You're doing it with a smirk. So no, no. Yeah, yeah, you, you know why I'm laughing? Yeah. I'm laughing because we did. Uh, you know, we talk about. First of all, it's nuanced. People who listen to podcasts understand. Uh, but you know, we do these like social media posts that are one minute. Yeah, and so people take things out of context. <laughs> Cardio does not send a muscle building signal. Cardio sends a build endurance signal, and it also burns a lot of calories during the time that you're spent doing it. So because it doesn't send a muscle building signal, and because it burns a lot of calories, the way your body adapts to it is by making you more efficient, giving you more endurance, but also making you more efficient with calorie burn. So you mm -hmm. end up losing muscle. You end up paring muscle down. <laughs> okay, so can cardio build muscle? It can if it improves your health. If you take someone who's really unhealthy, and they do any form of ex exercise that improves their health, they're probably going to have build a little bit of muscle or have uh, or be in an environment where muscle building is more beneficial or more, uh, you know, more obvious or may happen on right. a more often and basis. If fatigue is an issue in the gym when you're working yeah. out, and it can, you know, really aid in, in helping your endurance, uh, getting through some of these sets that you might be in a hypertrophy phase where you're doing lots of reps. Like, so there's some, some spillover there as well. Yeah. But well, just yeah, for no, the average person's health, right? Yeah. That's a, that's a health is the biggest part of it. And, it, and the endurance part is big too, though. Like there's, uh, th this is actually kind of the gauge that I use when I know that I need to implement more cardio into my routine is I'll make a transition into like a high rep phase of my training and especially when I get into something like squatting or deadlifting or some of these big gross motor movements, and I'm I'm gassed before my muscles are fatigued. Yeah. So I will I will feel like I can't do the next set in time, not because I don't feel like I got the muscle strength, but because I'm like winded. Yeah. yeah, I'm winded. Yeah. And so that that to me is like, oh, there I I would greatly benefit from more cardiovascular endurance yep. so I could train these these sets appropriately and stay on stay on task for my rest periods and the the high reps that I'm doing. But if that's sufficient, then I'm cool. Yeah. And, and also like, first off, building maximum muscle uh, is not most people's like ultimate goals. But anything that's extreme, you're going to take away from health and longevity, first off, okay? But let's say you're trying to speed up your metabolism. Let's say your metabolism is maybe not as fast or hot as you'd like because you've dieted so many times, you've cut your calories so many times, you've, you've pared muscle down with the wrong kind of workouts. Well, in that case, you want to do everything you possibly can to move the needle towards a faster metabolism. And you want to avoid everything you can that could potentially move it in the wrong direction. In that case, I would tell people to avoid most forms of cardio aside from, let's say, walking. Mm -hmm. Or let's say, like the episode that we pulled from, you want to build muscle and burn body fat, which is very hard to do. In fact, some people would argue it's even impossible. I don't think it's impossible but I do think it's a very, very like hard yeah. balancing act. You really have to draw that out quite a quite a ways. Totally, and and you want to do everything you possibly can to send the muscle building signal and avoid anything that could potentially counter that. And lots of cardio can definitely do that because lots of cardio makes your body better at cardio, which means you're gonna have less muscle on your body. So why long distance, uh, you know, runners and hardcore cardio athletes tend to have less muscle than like sprinters, for example. Right. But people take these things out of context well, and uh, they think that we're like anti-cardio. First of all, we're pro any form of exercise applied appropriately, any form. Well, sprinting is more anaerobic. Yes. So that's there's a massive difference with that. And I know some people were trying to argue what kind of cardio and like de define cardio, right? Because there are ways of moving fast uh, in short bursts that do have a muscle building effect. Yeah. Well, there's also ways to get some of the, the, the cardiovascular endurance through strength training too. Exactly. You do some, you do some 15, 20 rep squats and short rest periods. Push and the your heart rate is, is really screaming. Absolutely. Yep, so yep. you, you will build some good cardio endurance through that. So I'm glad you came back though, Sal, and, and reiterated that the, or the original, you know, um, clip where that got taken from, or the original episode where that clip was taken from, we still stand by that advice, right? If I get a client, yeah. if I have a client, okay, that <clears throat> comes in and she she hires me and she is 50 to 100 pounds overweight and she's been very sedentary and we start training, I am not putting her on any cardio equipment. Mm -hmm. I am strength training her. I might ask her to walk. I might say, hey, let's 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 pick up a 20 minute yeah, walk. You want her to be more active. Right. I want her, I want to encourage more activity and, and I might program that, but I am not programming 
you know, 30 minutes, an hour of any sort of cardiovascular. I'm not programming hit either. I'm mm -hmm. not doing any sort of well, explosive. Well, the risk is, that's the other part yeah, of it. The why? Risk goes at way that up. point, I am solely focused on building a faster metabolism. And the fastest route towards that is the advice that we gave in that episode. Right, yeah. And right. so, yes, I still stand by that philosophy. Now, the ultimate goal is to get her metabolism up, me drop down 25 or 30 towards her goal, start to introduce some forms of cardio, get this, this client way more active, get her be better cardio endurance, but not right now. Right now, if I'm, I'm looking the fastest way to get her to her goal, it is not by including cardiovascular endurance training yet. Yes. Not think, yet. Think of it this way. Think of exercise as a way to get your body to adapt fitness-wise and then think of diet as the way you get lean, okay? Think of it that way. Now, the adaptations can benefit the getting leaner aspect if they, let's say, counter what can happen when you cut your calories. So, so when you cut your calories, your body, want, it, it naturally will try to pare muscle down because muscle is very active. It costs a lot of energy. So if you're at a calorie deficit of 1,000 calories, at first you're losing weight, but your body's like, we got to meet this, these, these new caloric, this new caloric intake. Let's lower our demand. Yeah. The way to offset that is to do a form of exercise that strongly says, says get strong and build muscle. That's strength training. So this is why strength training is the best quote unquote fat burning form of exercise because it results in pure fat loss more often than other forms of exercise. But again, I want to say this, like we're trainers. Okay. We utilized all forms of exercise for our clients. Yeah. And when you're a good coach or trainer, you have all different forms of exercise, all different forms of exercise. There's different values, both mentally, physiologically, there's strength, there's endurance, there's stamina, there's mobility, there's flexibility. Then you also have to consider the, the, the person you're working with, with their psychology. What do they enjoy? What do they not enjoy? What's considered stress relief for them? It's so What's much considered too much stress for them? And then what you do is when you design the routine, you use all these pieces like an engineer uh, or like you're, like a, like you're a, a baker or a cook and you add the right ingredients to help them get to the, their goal the fastest or in the most effective way. And that's that can be tricky. That's what programming is all about. So the reason why we have a podcast and the reason why we never we started with the podcast is because it's long form. Yeah, these are not conversations you can have in thirty seconds. Yeah, it's hopefully there's a TikTok uh, uh, clip in there somewhere for all these uh, lazy turds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope. No, it's it's so much more nuanced than that, and I it, it's so funny when you get these relatively new trainers who want to argue the science and. I mean, you're, it just shows me how long you've been doing this for because right. it's not just that simple. Here's another example of where the the, the this is counter to what the studies and would say. Uh, I would take a, that same client. Let's use that fifty the client that's fifty to one hundred pounds over. And you know what I wouldn't do for her? I wouldn't tell her to cut her calories. Right. I wouldn't do that. I would actually tell her, I want you to eat more of the foods that your body needs. And so I would actually tell her to go after certain things instead of telling her to restrict yet. Like protein. Yeah. Now that is counter science because we know that what makes people lose weight is being in a caloric deficit. Yet I'm not going to tell my client, let's cut your calories. What I'm going to tell her is, wow, we don't get enough fiber in the diet. I noticed you don't get enough lean protein. So I want you to go after these foods every day, which seems that's Seems. because you're considering the, the human psychology and the behaviors, which as a coach and a trainer is the strongest consideration, especially when you're looking at weight loss and you're modifying behaviors. Whereas when people just know the science, they almost, they, it's like they ignore all that other stuff. Like it doesn't matter. And they're like, no, 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 cut calories. What are you talking about? That's what you need. That's to do. what the study says. Yeah. That's what the science says. That's yeah. why I want to, you know what? We got to make one of those to explode all these TikTok heads. Yeah. Is it Science says, is wrong. Like, you want to lose weight? <laughs> Add food to your diet. Just, oh! Yeah. Horrible <laughs> advice. How could they say that? Yeah. Oh. These guys are idiots. Oh, it's so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. You know, social, Wayne Norton, get them. You know what? You know what? It makes me realize how, imagine being a politician because politicians get attacked all the time. And what they do is a politician will give an hour speech or a 30 minute speech. And within that speech, their opponents are looking for gold nuggets that they could clip yeah. and use that in context. Jump on. That's and TikTok. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's exactly TikTok. A hundred percent what TikTok is. TikTok are these short 30 second or less clips. And, and if you don't listen to our podcast, fast food. if you yeah, don't listen to the whole junk. show, all you hear me saying is like <clears throat> lightweight builds muscle. Or you hear me say something like, you know, uh, car, car, don't do cardio if you want to get lean and build muscle. And everybody's like, ah, loses their mind. 
Wait, there's context. You got to have context. Well, you guys missed out on a conversation that Andrew and I had yesterday because he brought it to my, like, we don't even, uh, for the audience, uh, we actually don't even see half of our TikTok and reels and these clips that are made. We have a team that does that, that we trust uh, to to make good clips and do a good job. And they do a good job. Um, But every once in a while, a clip will go kind of viral. Like there's, there's one right now that just got put up, like, I don't know, like a few days or a week ago. Um, that's got over a million views already. <clears throat> and Andrew brought it to my attention and asked, like, you know, how do you feel about this? I said, let me see it. I haven't seen it. So he shows me the clip and they, they've they clipped it. And it's the, um, what this was the, uh, remind me, Andrew, of the 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 nuance of what Sal said on it. But it, it's was count- it the lightweight? Oh, the lightweight muscle? one. Thank okay. you. Yeah, it was the, the lightweight. Like, so the, the TikTok. Sometimes the, one of the best things you do to build muscle is lift lightweights. Yes. And people lost their lost mind. Lost their mind. Thousands of comments <laughs> and, oh, this is counter to what you guys say. And it's like, it's clipped from an episode where we talk in detail about the- <laughs> The behaviors of people, what they tend to do is yeah. go towards this way. Like I and me and I remember in that episode talking about I remember being a young kid who wanted to build muscle and I was I never lifted more than six reps for years. Mm-hmm. That was like all I trained because I everywhere I read, yeah. it said that if you that's what builds the most muscle. So of course, as a young teenage boy trying to build muscle, that's all I would do. And then I remember meeting this this smart bodybuilder guy and I asked him what should I do he asked what I was currently doing he said how long did you have you been doing that I said oh I always do that he says go lift lightweight and boom my arms exploded and I it blew my mind because it shattered my paradigm that was the point yeah Yeah. you're presenting a different perspective of where you know the same tools don't apply right and that's just the thing context matters and that's why you know these clips that are just like you know a few seconds long doesn't tell the whole story and then you want to jump on it and react like you just you're just a fool the studies are clear on this too by the way if you're a science junkie like reps (laughs) one to 30 all build muscle they all do which one builds the most muscle and when it's novel when it's new for you. So six reps can build great muscle if all you do is 20 reps and you've done that for a year. Yeah. And then you switch over to, to six reps. By the way, all of our, I think almost all, if not all of our MAPS programs has phases in both low reps and yeah. in high reps. Yeah. So we put our money where our mouth is. It's not like we're like all of a sudden changing our tune because a few people- This are, is not what no. they say. They say the opposite. Yeah, well, you, how many episodes have you <laughs> oh, listened there's to? There's so many tools to apply. Just the, the circumstances, you have to understand what you're working with first in order to grab the right tool and apply it to well, your client. So for the for the science junkies or for the person that's new into this and, and wants to be like the science junkie, you need to understand that studies are done- in these yeah, uh, twelve to sixteen six weeks. to sixteen week type yep. of range, mm-hmm. they're not done for years or months, even months and months and years and years, and so you have to understand that that that's that applies really well for that. That is the truth for six weeks. That what that study says, but when you extend yeah, that out, play over, that out longer. Yeah, when you play that out longer over twelve and then sixteen and then twenty four weeks and then fifty weeks, like. It becomes a little bit more returns. It becomes a little bit more nuanced, and you have to understand more than just that that small. Two things. Number one, one of the things that coaches and trainers who've been trainers and coaches for let's say a decade or two decades, all of us have experienced the following: the client that completely destroys everything that you thought to be true. We've all experienced that, where you think, "Oh, oh, I figured it out." I know everything. Then you get this one client where paradigm shattering. N- none of it works and it's totally different. And then you got to change your perspective again. That must have happened to me a dozen times over the last 20 years. And each time I became a better trainer and a better coach. Yep. Back to what you said, Adam. I'll use a great example. Okay. Um, I think most coaches and trainers who've been doing this for a long time would probably argue, probably 90% of them would argue that a barbell squat is going to build more muscle, general overall lower body muscle than let's say a leg press, okay? But I bet you if I did a study with beginners that was 12 weeks long, so people who don't really lift weights, and we did leg press versus squats, the leg press would build more muscle. Why? Because squats require so much more skill that by the time that these people develop the skill to squat effectively, the study's over. So what they got with the leg press was, oh, I could do this right away. We can add load versus the squat, which is we got to practice it and get good at it before we add any load and really start to build any muscle. So a 12-week study on beginners would say leg press builds more muscle. False. Follow those people for a year or two, and then you'd see the barbell squat is actually superior. What we didn't 
control for there was that learning curve and the skill required to effectively do the exercise uh, known as the barbell squat. Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 curve of adaptation matters, right? So if somebody if it's a if it's a very high technical skill movement, it's going to take you a lot longer to get good and reap the biggest benefits. But there's also benefits to the fact that it does take you long. Yeah, it's not it, it stays novel much longer. Very because, good point. Because you're trying to get good at it. Where a leg press, it, it very quickly, it's no longer novel. It's like very simple to sit your ass down in a seat like that and push your legs. Mm -hmm. And so your body goes, oh, figures it out really quick. There's a there's benefit to movements that your body is like, whoa, this is weird. This is different. Even after doing it for weeks and months. And that's a squat. Man, I mean, I've been squatting for years yeah. and still don't think that I'm a master plus, at squatting. Plus the uh, systemic, the adjacent effect of how it like affects the rest of your muscles, right? When you do like a, a bigger compound lift, like how that actually builds and improves muscles you didn't even anticipate uh, that were contributing and stabilizing and, um, you know, firing to keep your body in that. Okay, intact. so I'm going to hammer that a little bit home. So there's a direct local effect from strength training, meaning if I do curls, the local effect is the most pronounced, meaning the bicep that's working is the one that's going to get most of the effect. However, there is a systemic effect as well. And just to illustrate this, there's studies that are really interesting, weird, but they've, mo they've done these studies and they repeated them before. If I have, let's say my left arm is in a cast, okay, because I broke it or I injured it, and there's lots of atrophy happens whenever you have a limb in a cast. If you've ever broken an arm or leg, you know, 10 weeks later, you take it off and it's like, oh my God, I lost everything, right? So if I have my left arm in a cast and I work out my right arm, I will lose less muscle in my left arm than if I didn't do anything at all with my right arm. It actually sends a signal to the other arm as well. It says, yep. maintain some of this muscle. So one of the best things you could do when you have a limb that's injured is to train the rest of the body or especially train the opposing limb. There is a systemic effect. In fact, we had a caller recently who, who that's said what made that me think of it, yeah. he finally, he heard us talk about squats so much and how it actually will build the rest of his body. He did squats and his arms grew, his legs grew, but his arms Shoulders grew, as well. grew as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So pretty cool. What's up everybody. Today's giveaway is maps cardio. This is the endurance based workout program that doesn't make you lose muscle. It is designed to prevent muscle loss while boosting stamina and endurance. Here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. What we do then is we go through the comments, and if we pick you as the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section, and then boom, you got free access to that program. Also, we've got three workout bundles on sale this month. Each one gives you up to nine months of planned workouts. Each one is $300 or more off. This is one of the biggest promotions of the year because it's January. You got to go check them out. Go ahead and click on the link at the top of the description below. Learn more or just sign up. All right, here comes the show. All right, so um, so I, I wanted to talk about a study on eggs because what reminded me of this is, have you guys seen the price increase of eggs? Yeah. At the grocery store? I have not. It's I like know, I'm so mad. I'm so mad that I don't have chicken. It's 700 now. what? 700 Got rid of them. 700% higher? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'd cases. be sitting on gold right now. Yeah, like a dozen would be like two bucks, and now a dozen is like 10 bucks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, dude. Crazy, right? Yeah. Still well, cheap, but through the, the roof. avian flu or whatever, like just wiped them out. Yeah, supply went down. So egg prices are through the roof uh, in comparison to what they were before. But anyway, that reminds which is funny for me. Well, not funny, actually scary. I went to the grocery store, talked about this on a previous podcast. They had no eggs, went to another grocery store, no eggs. I was like, oh no, because I eat so many every day. Finally found some. <laughs> but anyway, found an interesting study or a cool study on the anabolic effect of uh, whole eggs. So I've brought up this person before, Vince Garanda. You guys, you guys know who that I is, right? You bring him up. So Vince Garanda was this like, he was one of the first, I don't know if you call him like science-based bodybuilders uh, in the early, early days of bodybuilding. So like, like 1940s, 1950s. Some of the stuff he said was brilliant. Some of the stuff he says may be controversial uh, and maybe not, maybe wrong. But a lot of the stuff he said was crazy. He was ahead of his time. One thing that he advised was for um, bodybuilders to eat uh, one to three dozen eggs a day, and they would notice steroid-like effects. Now, just to paint the context, the steroids that they took back then are not like what they did, what they would do now. So it's not going to compare to like what a pro bodybuilder is now. Back in those days- Probably like TRT version of it. Right? Well, back in those days, we'd take like five or 10 milligrams of, of Dianabol a day, and that was their cycle. Mm. Today, that's like- 
that would be like a joke. Like a bodybuilder wouldn't even, they would do like 50 milligrams of D-ball plus a bunch of other stuff, okay? Mm. So he would compare it to the context of the time. Nonetheless, there was a study that was done on egg consumption, and I'm going to read to you kind of what it, look, what it looked like. So they took 30 resistance-trained young males. So these are guys who worked out already, 30 <clears throat> of them. One group ate three whole eggs right after training, and the other group ate six egg whites right after training. So egg whites versus whole eggs. Ha three versus six. Three versus six. Okay. So protein intake is the same. The difference is the whole eggs has fat, uh, has the cholesterol and some mm -hmm. of the other nutrients and that kind of stuff. Both groups did three uh, full body workouts a week. This was a 12 week study. The group who ate the whole eggs had more fat loss, more muscle, more testosterone, and more strength. Wow. So they saw significant or statistically significant improvements, including fat loss. Haven't they called um, egg yolks like nature's multivitamin? I think I've heard that before. Eggs in general, yeah, like they're they're, they're one of the most nutrient dense foods. This is a find. this is a old study. So do they Back base in that his days right? No, yeah. no, no, no. This study, this study is. Oh, uh, oh so you are you're referencing Vince because he used to recommend that. Yes, but they did a recent study. This is I was more like, that's recent. Interesting that it's not because uh, I thought you were saying that was old. I'm like that's no. weird because in in the bodybuilding community, egg whites are so popular. No, I right. brought up Vince Garanda because one of the things he was known for back then was for taking his athletes and having them eat like lots of eggs every single day, and they would all get all these huge gains from it. Now, I obviously I've talked about this before. I eat between eight to 12 eggs every single day, whole eggs. And I notice significant muscle uh, gains when I do so, especially if I haven't done it in a while. If I haven't done it in a while, and then I go eight eggs a day, whole eggs a day, or 10 whole eggs a day, my strength gains are palpable. They are like huge, like 10, 15 pounds on, on most of my lifts. Pretty crazy. So what did, so did they parse out and speculate that it was like dietary cholesterol was a major contributor to that? They don't know. Okay. They think arachidonic acid, which is a fatty acid that might contribute to the muscle building process. I think it's the cholesterol. <clears throat> cholesterol is a, I mean, you, you could label it a steroid chemical. It's the building block for hormones. Mm -hmm. When I take my cholesterol from normal, not my blood cholesterol, by the way, my cholesterol intake, which has very little to no effect on your on your cholesterol levels. So nobody, everybody needs to relax with that. If you're otherwise healthy, you're going to be fine. But when I bump my cholesterol intake, I notice like, like testosterone boosting central nervous system activating effects. Like I'm stronger, libido's higher, more energy, better pumps. I don't get sore, I recover better. <clears throat> I think it's the cholesterol. When mm. you work out, your 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 blood cholesterol takes a temporary dip because your muscles are sucking in that cholesterol and using it for repair. So I think that dramatic increase in dietary cholesterol uh, is one of the reasons why the whole egg group built more muscle. Do you think there's a bit of a bell curve or a plateau that happens? Yes. Like you, you get it and then it's because you haven't had it and then yes. you get it and then it's amazing. And then do you think it starts to dip or do you think it just kind of plateaus? Kind of maintains. Just maintains. So I eat it like that every day. Right. If I were to stop, I would notice that I would start to get a little bit of a decline. And if I stop, and I'll do this every once in a while, I'll stop for two or three months, then I'll bump it up again. And it's like the first three to five weeks, boom, it's this huge boot, which is cool. If you're an athlete so what, or a power lifter, test this out on yourself. It may help you peak for your event. So what's the theory on that? Like that's because you, you get this from some supplements, right? Too, where you take these supplements and you feel this initial like, oh, wow, big difference. And then it just kind of levels off and then it never really gets better. It doesn't get worse, but it just kind of stays the same. You it is is the theory on that that there is there's an optimal amount that your body wants for optimal performance, and you were probably running, you know, pretty low or suboptimal, and then you get that, and then it it takes you to your your most ideal amount. Here's what I think is happening because so the reason why the whole like cholesterol, dietary cholesterol hypothesis of the 80s and 90s has obviously been debunked, right? Where they're like, oh, don't eat cholesterol because it affects your your blood cholesterol. We know that to be false because our body has this really remarkable mechanism for um, you know, manip modulating our own diet, our own blood cholesterol levels. So your liver will produce more or less cholesterol depending on how much you ingest. The old studies, by the way, that were done on dietary cholesterol that showed, oh my God, if you eat lots of cholesterol, you have terrible cholesterol. We're done on rabbits. Mm -hmm. Rabbits don't have this system in the body that regulates cholesterol. Ours does. So what I think happens is that initial three to five weeks, your body is starting to adjust, but in the interim, you just have way more of this cholesterol available. <clears throat> then when it adjusts, 
then you kind of plateau a little you bit. You know, you just said hmm. something that I want. I've been meaning to bring up to you for a while now, and I read it the other day, and I was unfamiliar with this um, that I find interesting. Because the prevailing theory is that we evolved from some type of monkey. Why is our digestive system more like a pig and not a monkey if that's what we evolved from, supposedly? Oh, I didn't know that. Do you know that our digestive system is closer to a pig than it is a, I any know, sort of monkey? I know pig hearts. Oh, look it up, Doug. Adam similar. bringing in the facts. No, I, I know that our skin is very similar. You, I think that's, and that's why they I find that really for, like, weird tattooing. that if we if we supposedly evolved from you know a yeah. a you know I think we're primates we're a primate we're right. a monkey well then why would our digestive system be so different than a monkey and it's closer to an so animal I like would a pig? guess this mm. I don't know what the dietary what do wild hogs eat well, a lot wild hogs are are they're root? omnivore right yeah they're omnivore yeah they, did you Google it right Doug and, yeah um, I'm trying to find the uh, the details on this um oh, yeah, obviously we're not like a cow no uh, no just to what animal what animal are humans digestive system most like okay. and you'll see it's not a monkey now, by I the know, way sure. before we get into this topic i just want to say that the egg price has gone up 60 percent, not 700 oh i read i read somewhere in some places 700 percent. <laughs> 700 percent. but think about that though it's a five dollar carton of eggs 700 percent. that's like 35 dollars math a is not my is buddy's true? strong suit no, no 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 i read it i read in some places up to 700 percent. okay yeah, yeah. well uh, but, but, yeah. what would be 700 percent? i read that same no well no it's like it been 35 a, bucks for a carton. An well, not if a carton's title. a dollar or something, the cheap ones. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah that's that's I think what they were talking about. Oh, I about. see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, but I just wanted to clarify that. Maybe maybe Doug, kind of maybe you could put Doug egg prices went up seven hundred percent. Just do that and see okay, if you can pull I'll up a couple articles. The, yeah, but yeah. first off, I'm gonna find I out did. whose digestive system is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I saw I I read this like it was a few weeks ago and I, I kept meaning to bring it up to Sal because I thought maybe he'd already been familiar with this and I thought you know, that's so funny to me that, you know, the, again, prevailing theory is that we've evolved from monkeys, Yeah. but then our digestive system is further away from than, uh, than, uh, them than a pig. Yeah. yeah so it says the human large intestine lies somewhere between that of a pig and a similar om omnivore and the dog. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We are, we are close, by the way, pig, we're the closest to, but we are closer to like multiple animals before we were even a monkey well well so we didn't evolve from monkeys we we were distinct uh we're distinct from monkeys monkeys are a type of primate we're also so a long time ago there was a branch so just to be clear because people be like well what you know well that's where the, were monkeys back then then you know, that, or why did monkeys exist back then but but i i would i'm gonna guess it's because our digestive system evolved around our hunting and gathering habits so we became apex predators and we became prolific uh, hunters. So we ate a lot of meat. And when meat wasn't available, we ate what was around Forage, us. Forage. Which, yeah. yeah, which were plants and roots and, and, and you know, berries and that kind of stuff. And so that would be, that's the, so if you look at our like teeth and our digestive system, it's got the characteristics of carnivores and yeah. omnivores. Yeah. Both. I'd say a bear would probably be similar too. I Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> I thought that was weird though. I thought that was yeah. a little bit of random stuff that I read that I thought was. Well, you know these pig that. hearts uh, for simulated heart surgery and stuff like that. And then they you said yeah. pig skin, yep. right? Pig skin heart. Yeah, it is interesting. There are some uh, uh, relations there between because, humans. Well, and I pigs. mean, when you when when evolutionists are trying to prove that that theory. They always tie it to things like that to show, like, oh, this is look this how is what's far, in common. look how what we have in common. Yeah. So I, I just find it interesting when science chooses to leave certain things out that doesn't that is that is does not prove their theory. Yeah. And that's something that is counter utilizing, like, oh, look how close we are to the bonobos by this, yeah. this, and this. And it's like, okay, yeah, but then our digestive system is fucking ten times further well, they, away. They so. base this off DNA, so our DNA and a chimp's DNA are remarkably similar, but that small difference is a big difference. Like yeah. we share most of our DNA with a banana too. Yes. So, so <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So, so it's crazy when we we cherry pick data like this to try and prove these theories, and it's just like guys, we we know so much less than what we act like we know. Doug, of. did you find the 700 percent increase? I did not. Uh, I, well, I was going to note that the human digestive system is significantly different from those of primates that share a high percentage of DNA. Mm. Interesting. I now, primates mm -hmm. uh, are better at- Dropping some science for you guys today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Coming in hot. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that came up for 700 in eggs is 700 reported out 
outbreaks of the bird flu. <laughs> oh, well. So I'm not seeing that. That's right. That's it's right. 100% increase in bird the, flu. The, 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 uh, the, the point he was making is true, though. Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> Thanks, Adam. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. it's really uh, expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't expensive It's before. extreme. Yeah. I appreciate it. At the end of the day, it's extreme. Yeah. <laughs> hey, speaking of diet, what you were talking about earlier when, with you, when you take an obese client, you tell them to eat more. My yeah. cousin... Uh, very close to my cousin, uh, Sep, him and I grew up together and he's like, he's like going on this thing now where he's like, okay, I'm going to watch my diet. He just got his black belt in jujitsu. So congratulations to him. And he's like, you know what? I got my black belt. I really want to improve my fitness because I want to be able to, to like, you know, wear the belt with pride and still kick ass or whatever. So he started to, you know, he inquired with me with macros and that kind of stuff. And I told him, I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Right now, just track your food and just try to hit protein targets and let's see what happens. Yeah. So he's a big dude. He's about... 215 about my height, you know, he's a pretty strong built dude. And I said, um, hit 200 grams of protein a day. And he's like, oh, okay, that, that shouldn't be a problem. I said, oh, well you try and let's right. see what happens. And he was probably surprised, huh? Very surprised mm, how always. much, it, it, how much it suppressed his appetite. He's like, bro, it makes me like, like I don't want to snack. I don't want to eat other things. And I'm trying to eat more of hard. this protein and it's hard. And then through this process, He's already starting to lose body fat, and I know he's gaining muscle at the same time because he's stronger yeah. when he's working out. This is over two weeks yeah. just from doing that. So yeah, his mind is being blown. Impact. And I told him, I said, we're going to reverse diet you. We're going to get your calories up, and then I'll cut you. And I said, I'll get you to the point where you're like 11 12%. I, I had been a trainer for maintained. over a decade before this came all together for me. Like, And to me, I would say this was some of the, the, the best – uh, or the the best shift I had in in the way I coach people because for up until uh, up so for a decade I would look at I would get I would put all the the numbers in the science the math I would go yeah. okay here's how much you weigh this is your age this is your activity level and then here's where I need to put their calories in based off of those those metrics for this person to lose weight since that's their goal and then I would prescribe that and I would create the custom meal plan and that is how I train clients forever yep. and i absolutely do nothing like that now it's exactly what you said is i i don't i don't care you like, well, eat whatever you want just hit these protein yeah, targets i don't even i don't even care your measurements you know that i don't even i don't even need that shit i don't even need the only thing i need to owe is your weight so i can get an idea protein wise right. right i don't yeah. care about all that stuff yet just give me where that is and track for a week so i can see what you do mm -hmm. don't try and impress me eat how you always eat and then from there what i always lead with because it's I don't think I've ever had a client. That's why I think when people are like, oh, I eat so much protein, I don't I don't need to focus on that. Like, okay. Because yep. in my experience, even the people who think they yeah. eat lots of protein. Because he did it for two days in a row. He's like, oh, I could do this. I said, Dude. give it four more days and let me know what you think. He's like, bro, he goes, I can hit 150. That extra 50, he's like, it just it kills my appetite. And I'm like, that's exactly well, the point. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've been going through that same process of, um, I've told you guys I would skip breakfast all the time for like years. And like, it was started really like, reinforcing the fact I got to eat consistently in the morning and just eating in the morning was a thing. But then me like loading it with like more protein than I've ever loaded it before. So I front load it instead of like trying to get it all in dinner like mm -hmm. I used to do. It, and it's just like, boom, you get this like anabolic uh, sort of burst uh, throughout the day, which is like totally new to me. Yeah. It's just, I mean, for since a majority of clients, so the average client when you're a trainer is a, you know, middle-aged female trying to lose weight. And that advice, what was, let me ask you this, Adam, cause I know what my number is, but on average, when you would have these middle-aged women track their protein and without you telling them what to hit, just let me just see where you're at. On average, what would you see the consumption be at? Uh, would they take? Yeah. 50 grams. A day. Yeah. Same. Yeah. 40 to 40 to 60 yeah. max. Yeah. 50 grams. Which is yeah. like, these are 140, 150 pound, 160 pound women. It's yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And, and then- Telling them to get that, they would run into the same thing. By the way, essential protein for a woman like that is around 50. They were barely hitting what's considered essential protein, yeah. let alone optimal. And and let alone somebody who's lifting weights and trying to build muscle. That's right. Yeah. So, there's, there, so the range is they could go much higher. They could go double and still be under what would be optimal for building muscle. Yeah. So they have a long ways to go. And, and instead of telling – and then, then you add in the psychological part. I mean, you tell a client who's way overweight and they hire a trainer – they get you, and they're for, they they know what's coming. Oh, I gotta cut this out. Yep. I gotta stop I'm ready that. To eat way less. Yeah, so, yeah, and so you blow their mind when you go like, and they go, "Oh, I gotta cut it." But no, no, no. I don't want you to cut anything out. I just want you to make sure you hit this number. Yeah, so I need to eat more. Yeah, more protein. You, yeah, so focus on that. 
and I, I don't care about anything else yet. So let's, and just and it blows their mind, and they're like they're like pumped. Like I hired my trainer to lose fifty yeah. pounds. This and is, he's telling me to eat more. You know my favorite part <laughs> of I know you guys experienced the same thing. My favorite part of that would be they would because you know you guys are convincing, so we can be very convincing. You have to be when you're telling someone to do something that's the opposite of what they anticipate. Mm-hmm. I literally have to have conversations, by the way, with people for forty five minutes to convince them to do this. Then they would try it, and I'd say, just trust me. One of my favorite lines. I'll ask you to do this one thing. Trust me once. You'll, I'll never have to ask you to trust me again. So I'd be like, all right, I'll do this. A month later, they drop, you know, 2% body fat. And then they'd be like, what? What yeah. magic are you doing Mystifying. to me? Mystifying. I'm, I'm so stuffed. How is this working? And then I tell them, you're actually eating less calories. I don't think you realize it because yeah. your protein is higher. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it because they feel so satisfied because right. they're eating so much. That's yeah. Right. No, it's seriously. Anyway, so I got to ask you guys for some help. I'm going to probably at some point need an intervention some point so you guys know my <laughs> i'm just being honest is this supplement based or i'm what, just being honest it? i'm gonna put it out there so that it's out there and okay. you guys can you know now you guys have to do it uh you guys know my complicated relationship with supplements yeah. powders okay. and pills well now i'm introduced into the world of peptides oh, with, God. Our, with our friends at mphormones.com right? you know doug oh. pulled me aside when we first did all this stuff and he said i need, I need you to keep a close eye on sal because oh. i feel like you're the only one that's going to be able to restrict pig. him yeah. You know what might happen, Doug? Is that Doug? racist calling you, you know a guinea pig? He'll come, what? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that. <laughs> like, I felt bad A lot of people it. don't know that that's a, that's a slur against uh, Italians. Right? Yeah, the first part. Not pig, yeah, but the, yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I was like, you know. I know. Yeah. I don't I, care. You can call me whatever you no, want. Yeah, but anyway, I'll say it to you what might happen is Adam's going to try and talk me out of it, and he'll end up leaving, taking new peptides himself. So be, <laughs> <laughs> be careful who you said to me, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty convincing myself. No, you know what? It's... it's uh. It's a crazy world. It is a, it takes, so supplements, exciting, fun for me. I love learning about them. I love mixing things together. I know that they only represent like 3% of any kind of progress, but still, I just, I love that. I walk around with a supplement bag. I've been like this since I was a kid. It's valuable for the podcast, I guess, but um, it's definitely something, it's definitely a complicated relationship. The peptide world is way more exciting, way more exciting. There's something like 7,000 potential peptides that are out there. Wow. And peptides have drug-like effects in the body. I mean, they really affect things like Yet hormones. Yet they're just a and, string of amino acids, right? Yeah. They are. That's why they're, and, and it's a gray market. So what I mean by that is you can, right now, and I would highly, highly recommend people don't do this. If you do this, you're, you're, you're kamikaze and you're probably going to end up with something not so great. But right now, the gray market, it means you can go online, you can buy a peptide so long as the peptide being sold to you is being sold to you for quote unquote research purposes. Mm. So you go on these websites that sell peptides and it says for research purposes only, not for human consumption. Mm -hmm. By the way, this means that they're completely, they're as regulated as a supplement industry. And you guys know how how crazy the supplement industry is and how often they find impurities, heavy metals, or like a supplement will say it's got something, it's got none of it in it. You're going to find this in that gray market for peptides. So don't go buy research chemical, you know, based peptides. And also, you're also not getting monitored by a doctor. So even if you get real peptides, you want a doctor to monitor you because these peptides have drug-like effects in the body. Okay. So that being said, if you work with like doctors who work with peptides, it is regulated through the compound pharmacy. So it has to have what it says, has to be pure, has to be clean. Yeah. All that You're stuff. You're not playing Russian roulette at that point. But well, this market is crazy, dude. I am learning. Like, I am diving in, right? I'm starting to become, you guys know what Obsessed Sal looks like. It's, I'm getting there, and I'm reading about these things, and it's wild. Let it's me a ask crazy you, emerging market. Oh, sure. dude. Let me ask you this, it's, it's It's going to be, it's going to blow up. Because of your up. experience, right, and the, what, what happened during the, you know, 90s and the, the designer steroid era, and that we how stuff a lot of times looks good and then comes out bad later. Yep. Do you do you think that the only reason why you're willing to play around with this stuff is because you're being monitored by doctors? Yes. And if you were not, would you be no, still? I would not. But 20, 20 year old Sal probably would have. Twenty year old Sal would have taken anything. <laughs> this is you, you Twenty year old Sal, and like, which is why I uh, like that's the part of me that now you know what twenty year old Sal might have done. He might have gone through. Uh, doctors because then he knows it's real. So that's how you would have got me at 20. You wouldn't have got me at 20 by saying, this could be bad for you, but like, whatever, I'll try it myself. Yeah. But if you said, hey, it's yeah. probably fake. Like, going to rip you off. Like your money's going nowhere. Yeah, it could yeah. be fake and you don't know and whatever. Then I would have said, okay, I'll go through a pharmacy because yeah. then I low. And the peptide, and it's not, 
you don't even need to, you don't even need necessarily blood work to get peptides from doctors. Although good doctors will say you should. Yes, yeah. and and you and, and look you should. and look back in the designer steroid era when you could buy them over the counter. Had I been monitored by a doctor, I would have known what I was doing. No, that's a, had that's bad why effects. I asked that question yeah. because th I actually would have taken those back then if I had that right. Like yeah. if, I, if I had the option to, if I if that was accessible as it yeah, is it was today, like illegal back then. I mean, yeah, I would actually, option. I would totally, I would love doing. Oh, a doctor would have been like, "Whoa, your liver enzymes are through the roof. Yeah, and yeah. Your natural testosterone Add this, went through take the floor. this away, lower this, increase that." Right. Like I would have loved to have somebody doing. Instead, I was the, the dumb kid who was just trying things out myself yeah. in my garage. <laughs> like Same how do I feel? Same here. So anyway, this peptide market's wild. They have a they have a peptide that I think it's called Mox C, I believe I'm reading about right now, that basically gets the mitochondria of so mitochondria is the powerhouses of all the cells, and it turbocharges all of them. Mm. So you're and and that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So if it works the way it's supposed to, I, I haven't tried it yet. You're basically all of your functions are improved. Everything about your 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 cognitive function. Muscle building, fat loss. Uh, people report getting feeling because I this. So I was talking to our, our partners at MP Hormones, and they brought that to me because I said, "Tell me about all the the cool ones that are out there. I want to learn." Mm -hmm. So they sent me some stuff, and I called them back, and I said, "This probably is going to boost your metabolism because if you if you turbocharge mitochondria, you're just going to get a lot of energy leakage. Your body's going to burn lots of energy through thermogenesis." And he goes, "Oh, when you take this, you feel warm." Mm. Because that's why people are talking about like they want it, they sweat afterwards and they get leaner. This is wild stuff. This is wild. <laughs> really crazy. And now yeah. they have me right now. I've already told you guys uh, in the audience, they have me on these like nootropic peptides. And uh, I'm, I'm a week and a half in. So far, really crazy, really wild. I, I'm getting real little sleep because of the baby and all that stuff. And uh, I feel. And no side effects or anything like that. The side effects I notice are good. Like I'm. Uh, strangely sharp oh, to, well, those, to the yeah. point where I'm like, this is weird. I'm talking about bad yeah. stuff. Like, and I know that like, uh, like uh, this uh, alpha brain doesn't fall or not uh, alpha. Yeah. Alpha brain. And then what were the other type of um, oh, prescription Adderall? No, 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 no. The other nootropics. Like so oh, like lion's mane. Pr Prisitin. No, like Prisitin. Pris oh, 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 yeah. Like those things, I had adverse effects to that. So that's yeah, like, headaches. They're, they're not, they're not in the same category no. as peptides. No. They're different. So what, what explain to me the difference? Like is peptides are just a string of amino acids and then what would be like Prisitin? So there's a huge, there's a, there's a huge range of what kind of peptides you can get and use for whatever your specific goal, you know, target goal is. For example, they have peptides that raise growth hormone. Some of them raise growth growth hormone by mimicking ghrelin, which mm -hmm. is a which will also raise growth hormone. Some of them directly tell the pituitary to produce more growth hormone. So they're different, but they both raise growth hormone. For example, the new the nootropic ones, like the ones that I'm taking, one of them is similar to BDNF. So by taking it, it's like I have more BDNF in my brain. And what BDNF does is it like signals the growth of, it's a neurogenesis. It's like more yeah. brain cells, more, Crazy. Um, yeah, better um, recall and memory. So when they test it on animals, the animals remember more yeah. when they put them through mazes and stuff like that. So it's a wild space. I don't recommend anybody get into peptides if you're not like optimizing anything else. I think that's stupid. But I think if you're like me and you like really like to move, you get around, all your your ducks in line, you know, then yes. you know you want something a little extra. I think it makes sense. Yes. You know what it reminds me of too, because that's a very new emerging space that that people are kind of like getting into. Remember when we had Zach on from Zbiotics and he was talking about like probiotics and ways they'd be able to manipulate like yes. bacteria for yeah. like functions of the body and all that. I wonder if that will be like the next following the peptide sort of uh, that's, trend. That's, that's a really... That's CRISPR technology where they're using, right? Or was it similar? Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. Didn't something crazy yeah, happen just now in the news? Yeah, a girl with was cured, uh, cured of cancer through that. That just, ha that just was announced, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where was it? Was that here in the US or somewhere oh, else? Oh, I think it was in the UK. Maybe Doug can look up. It was a blood cancer. Young girl had uh, really... Uh, this was remember. a big... This was a big fucking deal. Totally cured her. Cured her. So it was, it was through <clears throat> gene editing. Yeah, gene editing. And yeah. they basically... Can, told her body to get rid of the cancer, and it did. <sighs> and it was she's cured, completely cured. Nuts. Now this is wild because Do you guys think we're on, we're we're going to see it in our time. In Dude, our there's lifetime? so many like, breakthroughs happening right now. It's hard to keep track. There's there's two revolutions that we're on the cusp of. One is a uh, biological revolution, or you know, through medicine. Yeah. 
And then the other one is going to be uh, technology. And what's crazy about now, the that technology is going to drive everything. It's going to feed the, the, the other one. Technology is going to feed energy. It'll feed so medicine. So imagine, imagine when the, the AI side catches up to this and we can actually input. I mean, so what, what is it? Doug, go ahead before I move on. Yeah, so next generation gene editing was used to create a therapy that attacked a 13-year-old's stubborn leukemia. So it's in remission. Wow. God, man. Where did you, where imagine she, she, where'd you say she's based out of? She's in the UK. UK. It was UK. You imagine, you give me the chills. You imagine if you were her parents. Oh, oh my God. God. And it then that emotional. happened. It God sent. Oh, yeah. I don't even want to think about it yeah, right yeah. now. I'll start you, you know, the, the, so along these lines and technology and the evolution of that, so I saw an article came out that the first AI robot is going to represent a person in court uh, <laughs> oh God! For, a, for now, think about this for a second. I actually, <laughs> how's I, that been, legal? We, well, we've been on this whole crazy like Chat GPT thing and everything, like that, and talk. And I actually, this didn't really dawn on me. Drinking challenge, everybody listening, bro. Like, okay, every time we bring listen, it up, right up. listen to this though. Yeah, that is actually a space that this is going to disrupt like a lot more I mean, than anything. I mean, okay, one of the what makes a, a badass lawyer is a lawyer know all the laws. who knows all the law, yes. and knows all the loopholes, and knows all like and. Yes. It, you're going to input that into an sure. AI robot, sure. and you cannot tell me that he's not going to be a ultimate better ultimate reference machine. You know who? You know where it's going to start? Yeah. I, I'm, you just made me think of something. Tax att tax attorneys. Oh, the yeah. tax code is so all the crazy loopholes that you yeah you never were aware of. Yes, imagine Dude, having it's yeah. going to it's like it's really like why like you could represent yourself yeah. with your AI robot pretty better than probably that doesn't mean like the best of the best lawyer who not only knows all the law can also speak and win a, a jury over okay his job is probably still safe he's the 1% yeah, of, yeah. of that industry for now but you can't tell me that 80% of the lawyers that are just like you know below average or average compared to the elite lawyers would not be replaced by a brilliant AI tool that knows the law better than they know the law. Sure. And then all you have like, to do is prompt it. Or like, like the free attorney oh. you get from the state when you, you know, you're, what you're, was this? So that's that, what I think this is. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, there was already it's a, a, um, a website that was like, like you basically can type in, it can get you out of like parking tickets. Like it, it, it's an advocate for you for like all of these like uh, ways of, of being able to um, defend you against like legal issues. So, you know what I'm thinking? Like oh, this is way down the line, but you get like a, a really good, you know, prosecutor lawyer who can read every micro, you know, adjustment of your face and your eye, pup your pupils and whatever. And it's like is like yeah. questioning someone and yeah. making like an crack. interrogator, yeah. just like you know, <laughs> knows all your vital signs. I don't like, know, yeah, man. We, heart we rate. Are, it's, <laughs> dude. I, I think it's a lot closer than what I. I'm so just, freaked out about. I am. It's, <laughs> you know, okay, so I, I talked about it on my my NCI talk yesterday, and I and I said, you know, I want I want to be clear that uh, I don't want to feel like I'm fear mongering everybody on here. Like, I think that I'm, I'm excited about it. I want to, I, I think there's a lot of good things that are going to happen, but I, what you hear from me is the passion behind it. Like I feel so strongly about this is here. It's not, but where a year ago, if you were to ask me about it, I would have more of a dismissive type yeah. of attitude. 20 years, like, 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, when we get closer, like now I'm like, Oh, we're here. It's yeah. here. It's coming. Like we're, we're right around the corner from this, like really disrupting everybody's space. And if you or an entrepreneur, which is who I was speaking to, nothing but entrepreneurs, yeah. you got to be thinking of creative ways to integrate it within your business or you will get left behind on the people that adopt it. And so it's just like, imagine being in the brick and sort the analogy I give them, imagine being in the brick and mortar business and or having a business back before the dot com era happened, and you being dismissive about dot com. Yeah. Oh, it, people aren't going to buy stuff on the computer. Yeah, that's so stupid. <laughs> We're going to put all of our money back into the yellow pages. You and know, when eBay door first to door came, shit. Like, I, I trained two people who were one of the first employees at eBay, and they retired after, of course, when it went public. And they said when eBay came out, the criticisms were hilarious. Like, oh, people are going to trust other random people yeah. on the internet to yeah. send them stuff and be honest. It's That's going to fail. Oh, it's the same with Uber. Like, all of a sudden, all the drivers were going to take them somewhere and murder them. Yeah. yeah. Or rape them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's just going to happen. Right. Like, every time. Did you guys see Did you guys see the next phase of home security? Th that ring is not is dropping? What is it? Oh, it's cool. Pull Does it, it up. have laser beams? No. Damn. What it is. No, listen out. <laughs> This, I mean, this technology was already there. It's crazy that they, obviously they're the first to do this. How brilliant is this? Okay, so now the the new cameras. You know, right now we had to drill all these fucking holes in our yeah. in our thing, and we had these. Now you have these the motion sensors. This thing is docked, and it's a drone. And when the motion sensor goes off, it activates the drone, 
and oh, then you yeah. can and then you can control it manually what, or it fly it, around your house. Yes, and it doesn't have laser beams on it, and it, it flies That's around your house and records. And so you can either or I'm you can either set it up to be motion activated yeah. or manually do it yourself, where you launch it. Can you imagine someone breaks in your house, you fly the drone above them so they can't reach oh. it, and you're like, "Hey, man, get out of my house!" Or like flipping you off, taking yeah. your shit. You're like, oh, get out of my house. Think of how sick that is, though. That is cool. I that did brilliant. you hear? Speaking of which, did you see what the, what Roomba? You know, Roomba's are those things yeah, that yeah. vacuum or whatever. Did you hear about what happened? Mm -mm. So apparently Roomba takes pictures of your home and stuff so that they can to continue to use AI yeah. to map right. it out. Yeah, so they well, can sell you stuff. So they know what rooms you use and what type of well, stuff. Well, apparently there were some tech workers somewhere or people, <laughs> whatever, who were able to upload pictures from Roomba and some of them were inappropriate, like people on the toilet or people, whatever. Because, you know, you're having sex. Roomba's cleaning the house. Yeah. And they uploaded these, these pictures of inside people's houses of them doing stuff. Wow. That's, oh, that's, that's the drone right there. Look at that. Is that sick? That's, that's actually really not cool. the Ring one. That's a different company, I think. Is that Echo. Ring? I can't. I uh, think it's Ring. Yeah, uh, oh, the top one. Isn't that cool? That's cool. So that's it stays cool. docked, and then you can launch it. In I mean, yeah. Doug, come on, get on this. I want this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. This is everybody cool. gets a ring. Yeah. yeah. A ring drone. Not for us personally, for our houses, dude. Come yeah. on. I think yeah. that's so cool. Hey, we're supposed to mention uh, Ned. Uh, by the way, I want to talk about their sleep blend. Uh, I gave it to one of my cousins. Uh, because he's been having insomnia. And I'm like, oh, this this is not for everyday use, but this will knock you out. He you took it. He's like, bro, he goes, so I woke up with a beard. He goes, what did you give me? <laughs> he's like, I slept so hard. I don't know what happened. You know what's so awesome about that? Oh, is yeah. Your family's so big. You have the commercials for the next like three years. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> I gave my family. I gave my family. Like, it's yes. always a family member. You I have, can well, I have some <laughs> family members that'll take anything I give them. Yeah. yeah, my dad's one of those people. By the way, my uh, dad, he'll come over and I'll give him something. My mom's always, she's always like, "What are you giving your dad this time?" <laughs> Don't, Don't worry, me. I got this. Yeah, yeah. I'm so fine. you know, it's it's funny, like, because uh, you know, I'm the opposite, right? I'm like so trustworthy of like, like you've already won my trust over, yeah, so you yeah. could just hand me any pill, and I'm like, okay, what was he just it? Eats you know? it <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Katrina is the opposite. Like, even like uh, all the information she has learned from us, and are, like, if I try to give her something, she's like so anti taking. Really? Yeah, anything. I'm like, honey, is she like anti like uh, like pain medicine too? Oh like, yeah. Oh, she, see, she takes no. I noticed that some people are like that. They she's, won't even take pain. Medicine. She's never been on birth control she's never taken any pharmaceutical stuff like she's like hmm. getting her to take something is like really like she's rather all natural so that's how i have to sell it to this is herbal it's natural yeah. Oh, yeah. take it <laughs> trust me you know it's but it's like earth. even with the like the cold thing like i was trying to explain we both went through being having sick right being sick recently and i was sharing with you on one of the last episodes that you know i've gotten better since i've been around you of like you know, st putting that stack of the, you know, the zinc and the, like all, yeah. all, all the different things that we take, like when we get to prevent, to prevent it. Right. Cause I've always been kind of eh, whatever about it. And then by the time it happens, I'm like, Oh, it's too late, but mm -hmm. like trying to be proactive and then like really hitting it hard. And when I'm consistent with that, I do notice a big difference. So yeah. I, I mean, I can, I can, it, it, and it's, it's, it's enough that it's like, it's worth being mostly severity. Because yes. you might still get sick. Oh, you still get sick. sick. I, yeah. I, I, I don't think I could, I can't, I would not claim that I've taken it. I'm like, oh, it got rid of it. But what I, I am the type of person when I get it cold, I'm a big ass baby. And part of that is because I, <laughs> I have that attitude of, oh, what, let it run its course. I don't really do shit for it. Maybe it takes some night cool at night so I can sleep. Yeah. But I'm really bad about taking all the, all the supplement, all the herbal supplements to try and mitigate some of it. And it makes a big difference when you do. I told you guys a long time ago about that study on the man cold. You know, there's like, like there's that 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 thing about men when they get a cold. It's so much worse than when their wife gets a cold. They did a study on it, and we do get sicker. We do get sicker. Wow. Oh, is that true? Wow. We experience Proof. we experience the illness uh, more, the pain and severity of the illness more. Now, other types of pain, women apparently experience more. Now, this was one study, so it's not confirmed, but I thought it was funny. And then I come up with my evolutionary theory. I said, well, you know why? Because I was talking to Jessica about this a while ago. And she's like, that's bullshit. And I'm like, no, it makes sense if you think about it. I said, if you're a, if you're a gatherer and you get a little sick, like you can still gather nuts and berries and shit. I said, if you're a uh, hunter and the, the hunting party's going to go out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the and our hunting stomachs are so different. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a little sick, you got to stay home. You're going to prevent everybody from killing the buffalo. You know what I mean? <laughs> She's like, you're stupid. Yeah, I don't know, dude. Because Courtney gets like knocked out when she gets sick, and then will give me shit about just like you know complaining one time. Oh, does Courtney like that? Huh? She gets it bad. So yeah. Katrina does not at yeah. all. I'm the I'm always. I right. just power through everything, dude. Yeah, she's a champion. He does. Man. Justin and Doug have really good immune systems. Yeah, 
D- Doug especially. I thought I was going to get sick no, after Doug traveling Doug and all a, that. Nothing, dude. Doug is the best. There was far. a period of time yeah. there we didn't get sick at all for like years, s- like seven years, like never. And yeah. even when all of us get sick. He if he gets it, it's like my super. It's like four mind. hours. Even yeah. COVID, like when we all got COVID, yeah, yeah. Doug's like, he's like I dead. Twenty four hours. He's like, oh, Bro. my lines already disappeared. I'm cool. Like, Fuck you <laughs> yeah. guys. I attribute it to being the dirtiest. Yeah, like yeah. I get dirt on me. I don't care. Yeah, I don't use hand sanitizer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I'm exposed Doug, Doug. to Doug's everything. That guy. Justin was a kid that ate dirt. Yeah, know, I was out playing. there digging the dirt, smearing on my face. What's you your? Know, what, why do you think you are? What's your? What's your take? You know, I don't I know. know. And I'm outside the I mean, most. Was I, it your mom like that? Didn't you? My say mom it? was that way. Yeah, yeah, she went like I don't know, 20 years without ever getting a cold. Oh, uh, so you genetic? Like so that. maybe it's a genetic. There's thing. something about your immune system, man. Huh? Yeah, that's wild. All right, we're also supposed to mention uh, Joy Mode. I wanted to talk about one of their products. It's a it's a test, quote unquote, testosterone booster. I'm not a huge fan of testosterone boosters because most of them don't do much. Although. They put together one that's pretty damn good. So what they did, and I love their strategy, is they did put something in there that has been shown to raise testosterone in men with low testosterone. That is the KS66 strain of ashwagandha that has been shown in studies to raise testosterone. But then they also put compounds in their product that raises free testosterone by preventing total testosterone from getting bound up by sex hormone binding globulin. So uh, just not to get too deep in the weeds, testosterone has, if it's bound, it's worthless. So you can have all this testosterone, but if it's bound by something called sex hormone binding globulin, your body can't use it. There are things that you can take like DIM, boron, that will actually free up more testosterone. So even if your testosterone goes up 10%, but then you free up more of it, you get much more of a boost. So it's one of those few products out there in that category. It's one of my favorite categories. But it's one of those few products where I looked at the ingredients and said, okay, they're actually science-based. Isn't, Isn't it formulated from our friend Eric Kessler? Is yeah, that- he, he helps. Actually, I think his name is, what is it, Doug? Trexler. We had him on the show. Really smart dude. And then his Instagram is Trexler Fitness. So T-R-E-X-L-E-R Fitness on Instagram. Uh, very smart dude. Very, very smart dude. So if you like to get in the science of, uh, of all the stuff, fitness, uh, give him a follow. All right, check this out. In today's episode, you heard me talk about peptides, that whole market of interesting compounds that could do things like boost growth hormone, uh, improve cognitive performance, uh, suppress appetite, make you feel better. I mean, it's a crazy, crazy market. Well, our partners at mphormones.com are experts in peptide sciences. They also work with hormone replacement therapy, so you can get your testosterone levels checked, your estrogen and other hormones like thyroid, and then they can help optimize your body through medical intervention, working with doctors and coaches. By the way, our partners at mphormones.com are some of the only people where if you work with them, you've got 24-hour access to one of their coaches. Literally, you can ask them questions, give them feedback, adjust your dosages. Like, I don't know anybody else that does this. Go check them out, fill out intake form, talk to one of their experts, see if peptides and hormone replacement therapy is right for you. Again, it's mphormones.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Louis from Washington. Louis, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. uh, Got a question for you guys. Uh, So, you know, a little backtrack. I used to be really into weightlifting uh, way in my early 20s. I did, uh, what was it? It was actually Tiki Barber's uh, workout. Uh, with power lifting and uh actually got pretty good you know my uh uh, squatting 340 i was uh repping out 225 on the bench uh, for like 10 reps pretty easily uh of course that's after college and started working for the past 10 years and i've been really sporadic about getting into gym um so finally decided after listening to you guys for about a year or two uh i bought the rtb bundle okay and i just got through a phase, or pre-phase of anabolic. Uh, last week, I was in a gym, and it was one of those packed days where I couldn't get on the bench or um, in the machine. So I was on the uh, – I did my – so bench, I did a dumbbell bench. And instead of uh, tricep pushdowns, I did single arm tricep extensions. And my left side is drastically weaker than my right side. Mm-hmm. I mean, easily 10 pounds. On the left side, weaker, and maybe I've got five still on the right side to press when my left side is shaking. Wow. Wow. Okay. 
So my question was being, do I stop anabolic now? And I've heard about symmetry. And should I hop in that or am I better off trying to get my strength back overall with anabolic and then hop it on symmetry? You're, you're only past pre-phase? Yep. And, and what did you do before this? Or are you just getting started? Uh, just getting started. I've had, you know, like I said, sporadic. Ugh. I mean, I've wasted thousands of dollars on trainers who couldn't really teach me anything. Okay. Let's throw him, uh, so, let's throw him symmetry. Yeah, yeah but get, well, well, here's the deal, though. Good... If he wasn't working out, so if I took the average person who isn't working out and I had them do unilateral exercises, you're going to see that big of a difference, if not bigger. So that's why I asked you what you were doing leading into MAPS Anabolic. If you've been working out up to MAPS Anabolic yeah. and you have that, then I would say go straight to symmetry. He has a powerlifting background, too. Yeah, so. if you haven't worked out for a while and then you got into symmetry and then you did pre-phase and you see this, you're going to get a certain level of balancing out with MAPS Anabolic. So that's why I asked. So, so up, to, up to starting MAPS Anabolic, how long was your layoff or how long were you not working out for? It's, you know, probably a couple of years, but then it'd be like I'd work out for five months and then, you know, I wouldn't work out for six months. And then I'd work out for three months and then I'd be off for two months. Yeah. Kind of hitting it. I think you're fine doing MAPS Anabolic and then going to Symmetry. You're going to, you're going to balance out quite a bit just because you're strength training again. Like I said, if I take the average person and have them do anything unilaterally, mm. you're going to see a bigger difference than what you see. In fact, yeah. you'll, you'll see a, such a big difference. No, no, no I agree. Like, I yeah. agree. Finish, but we're, we're going to throw them. Give them symmetry. Yeah, Give no, it to yeah. them. We're going to send you symmetry so you have it and then run through anabolic and then afterwards jump into symmetry and, totally. then, and then return to performance after that. Totally. 100%. All right. That's awesome. Louis, uh, quick on to that because um, I also, my chest is my weakest point, so I picked up the uh, add-on for a chest from you guys mm -hmm. uh is it too soon to throw that in or should i get through yeah. a whole yeah an answer? yeah yeah hang on that'll, that'll be of value to you but hang on to that i wouldn't implement that yet right now i go through anabolic the way it's laid out then i do symmetry the way it's laid out and then go into performance and then maybe add start to add that when you get there into you like go. aesthetic because aesthetic is focused on actually more of how your chest looks and symmetry and you're, you're going to get some of that in there anyway so i think that would pair nicely with uh, uh maps aesthetic exactly that's what i was doing Okay, sounds good. You got it, man. Thanks for calling in. Thanks, guys. All right, Louis. Yeah, that 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 Tiki so, Barber, bro. What's the last time you heard that? I haven't heard that. He name must in have a long been. Time. Did he say he was a football player? Uh, he, was he an ex football player? I mean, Tiki Barber is a running back for the yeah. New York Giants, which is kind of a random. But oh, he no was. No wonder you guys know who like I'm a like, decade ago that he yeah. retired. Yeah, yeah. He went to broadcasting afterwards for a long time. Did he? Did I hear he, did he, can you look up Tiki Barber to see, he's alive, right? Interesting. I think so. He you know, the, the, the thing that, see, the reason why I asked him that question is that I want to reemphasize this. If you're deconditioned, you're not working out, your right to left imbalance. No, that was a huge. great yeah. point. That was yeah. a great point. It's going to be huge. Yeah. No, no. And you'll get it. You'll, it'll balance out with barbell work to a certain extent. Now, once you do barbell yeah, work for a, a long time, yeah. yeah, then you're going to want to do unilateral work. Now that's not to say, and I want to well, say this to the audience. That's not to say going straight to symmetry would be bad either. No, no, no. It'd be perfectly I, that's fine. What, I mean, I was I was about to counter you on that, but honestly, because of his like gap uh, in between training, mm -hmm. I think that yeah, you're spot on with that because it's him just to get back in and build a base again is going to take some time. And then that's it. Uh, if he was like continuously like training, and then he saw this big discrepancy, 100 percent, you go into symmetry. Yeah. yeah. Our next caller is Roberto from the UK. Roberto, what's going on? How can we help you? Hey guys, super excited to be with you. It's uh, it's super cool. I've been listening for the past two years, and it's uh, learning a lot, but also it's a lot of fun. To be honest, I'm a I'm father of two kids. I'm almost forty years old, so I I can relate a lot. Awesome, very Sweet. nice. Thank you. What part of Italy are you from? Uh, Milan. Oh, so beautiful. the north. Yeah, different. <laughs> yeah, my family's from the south. I know. <laughs> anyway, go ahead with your question. I've been uh, in UK 10 years, but I keep the accent, as you can hear. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm very passionate about calisthenics. And my question is about what is the best way to build strengths to achieve very challenging calisthenics goals? So more specifically, when you look at the program, how much should you focus on what you want to do versus how much you should mix it up with exercise, general exercise to build strengths? Oh, great question. So the uh, first thought, how many days a week are you doing calisthenic workouts? So I work, uh, I work out four days a week. At least this is what I try to do. Uh, sometimes it lands around three days a week. And um, 
what I am at, uh, I'm can do, I can do a free handstand push up, and my goal would be how to can I get to three. And I'm pretty good in pull ups, muscle ups, but my goal would like, I would like to be able to do a one arm pull up. Oh, so wow. how do we, how do I build all the strengths there at that level doing oh. calisthenic and weighted calisthenics? Roberto, I'm going to give you two things that's going to that's going to make a big difference here. Okay, so uh, number one, a great deal of the ability to do what you're what you're trying to do has to do with skill, especially the handstand push ups. So a lot of that is skill. So you could be strong enough to do that, but not have the right skill and not not be able to do it, or you just exert too much energy trying to balance one arm pull up. There's also some skill involved, uh, a little bit less. Here's the best thing you can do to, to, to mix it up. One day a week, I think you should work on heavy lifting. So weighted pull-ups will help you a lot. Pick a, like strap a weight around your waist yeah. and do sets weighted of like, too, yeah, yeah, three sets of uh, three reps or four reps with weighted pull-ups. That will give you a lot, a lot of strength for that attempted one-arm pull-up. And then your handstand push-ups, I would do the same thing with the standing overhead press. I would go three sets of like three reps with a heavy barbell. Now you're not going to failure, but you're training at a moderate to high intensity, low repetitions. You're trying to build kind of low rep strength because that will, for what you're trying to accomplish, that'll give you some nice carryover. But that's once a week. The the, the majority of the week, you're still practicing your calisthenics. Yeah, I mean, there's a process to this too. Like gymnastics is a very like methodical approach to a lot of the calisthenics, like and really, you know, uh, getting into positions that are a lot more intensive uh, with gravitational forces. So, you know, um, I wish I could refer to a very specific program, but the way like in terms of like using tools and things for this, like our suspension trainer is a good tool for this to really scale, like from away from the anchor point, you can intensify the, the angle there. Um, and, and you put your foot through the straps and you kind of like push yourself back and kind of walk gradually into that position. You can also do that with a wall where you just kind of start with that. And then you work your way up towards things like, um, parallel bars that you put underneath to where you can get even more depth, uh, you know, in range of motion and strength and work on that exclusively. Uh, one thing really though, with the calisthenics is be body control. Uh, so, uh, one thing too, like that, uh, uh, in terms of working on that with gymnastics too, they'll do a lot of things like hollow body positions and, and rocking positions and things where you're actually like connecting all the way from your fingertips to your toes. Uh, and so to, to be able to have that kind of strength and control and connection, I think is, is valuable to work on all that stuff to build the groundwork for being able to control your body, doing what Sal says in terms of strengthening your body with load. Um, but a lot of core work, a lot of like intensive uh, isometric positions that will help to kind of build and reinforce that connective strength. Roberto, are you following anything right now? Do you have a program that you either did yourself or you did you buy somebody's? Yeah, no, I did it myself. I'm uh, basically I have two routines. One I do uh, push and leg, and the other one pull and leg. And the reason why I I added legs is because I was listening to you la for the past three years and last year. I started to try to start deadlifting and squat and it was a bit magic because by doing legs, I got stronger in the, in the shoulders, right? Oh, so okay. that's what you guys were doing. And so that's why in my mind, I'm thinking, should I do something that you say, kind of get away from calisthenics and try to do, I don't know what Adam, you call the, the bodybuilding style, more hypertrophy, or should I do more? Uh, I don't know, just wondering whether should I do some mix and change to try to change the, the, the current situation of Plateau? We really should write one of we these. We should. Yeah. I mean, close we have maps anywhere. If you haven't done that program, I think that'll at least build a good base for control and core strength. Um, and we did a good job programming that yeah. to body weight and like being able to intensify it. But send that we over. We should, yeah. yeah. One day a week, one day a week, do barbell work, overhead press, weighted pull ups. I think you should also practice heavy uh, preacher curls one arm at a time only because a one-arm pull-up uses a lot more bicep than a two-arm pull-up. You ever watch someone do a one-arm pull-up, they stay close to their arm, so it's a lot of bicep. When you do a two-arm pull-up, you tend to lean back and use more back. So getting strong biceps becomes more key with a one-arm pull-up. So you could practice low reps, preacher curl, get a dumbbell, and practice you know, five reps. You're not going to failure. Okay. So keep the intensity moderate. And I'm talking about a 45 minute workout max. That's what you're doing with the barbell stuff. So Jack Lane is one of the godfathers of, of fitness. He also set a record 
uh, of push-ups and pull-ups. I think he, th- he did a thousand each, and it, at, at fifty-something years old, and it stood for for decades and decades until Goggins, right? And yeah, and when they interviewed him about it, and they said, "Well, what, what's your secret?" He said, "Heavy bench presses and weighted pull-ups." So, and back then that was revolutionary because nobody mixed the two. They thought you you did weighted stuff. We want to be a bodybuilder. But if you want to be able to do push-ups and pull-ups, you just do that. So once a week, I think, would be plenty to see that carryover and do like four exercises, you know, overhead press, weighted pull-ups, maybe some some heavy curls, maybe some, you know, heavy bench presses. That's about it. Will you keep uh, deadlift and squats in the other days or something like that? If, if, it, if, it would be yeah. in that day. It yeah. would be in that It would day. be on that day. So you, yeah. you could cycle those in. By the way, I'm so happy you came on to tell people – how you deadlifted and squatted and you got stronger shoulders. When we yes. communicate that, we yeah. get a lot of pushback from the bodybuilding coaches because they don't understand uh, you know, how that could possibly work. But there's a systemic effect from squats and deadlifts that you don't get from a leg press, you don't get from a hack squat, and you get this kind of this overall body uh, strength gain, most of it being in the legs, but some of it going everywhere else. So I'm glad you came on to say that. And sorry, what what should I do the other days? So the one day very heavy, like uh, low reps, heavy stuff with barbells, and the other days uh, your calisthenics, calisthenics. Your calisthenics. calisthenics that you're doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And, and yeah, we're gonna and, and we're gonna we're gonna send you since you're kind of programming yourself, we're gonna send you Maps Anywhere, which has a bunch of calisthenics in there that you can pull from. So you can kind of take maybe what you're doing, or maybe you'll see some things in there that we program that you weren't currently doing that you could add in there. And so you can use some of the the stuff in anywhere for what you're currently doing, plus the advice that Sal's saying. I think that would yeah. be perfect. Thanks a lot. Super cool. You got it. All right, Roberto. Thanks, Roberto. All right. Have a good one. You got it. You know, at one at we, one point, I was trying to do one arm pull up, and um, I didn't. Uh, I learned the hard way how much more arm there is in a one arm pull up than a two arm pull up. It's like yes. so much more arm. You know what? There might be even. I know we didn't say it to him, but he'll listen to this. It, it, when he does his weighted pull ups, is actually to intentionally keep it close yeah. and tight. Yeah. Because that will. It looks more like the form. Yeah, that's, yeah. Right. that's true. Even totally like true. scaling it where you hold your yeah, yeah. arm and then you go without your arm too. Mm-hmm. So and do like isometrics at the top. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true. We should have added all that. Well, I we, hope you're listening, Roberto. We need. To, we ought to write a cow. I know. I know. Not, I know it's not on the agenda. Depends but how many DMs and messages we've had a we few get. requests, yeah. but it's, <laughs> let's see if people. It's not as that. high. I, I don't know. I feel like we'll see. I, you know, when we talk about like, when we mention something like that, we normally get a big enough response when it's something that we need to do. So maybe if we get enough people telling us we need to write a calisthenic program, we will. Our next caller is Jennifer from Missouri. Jennifer, how's it going? How can we help you? Hi, I'm good. Hi. Wow, the men of Mind Pump. This is awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on today. Um, I'm a huge fan of your guys' show. I, uh, I actually just found you uh, within the last six months. And um, yeah, I've, I've learned so much from you guys uh, just in the short time I've been listening. Um, Thank you. Totally entertained, obviously. Um, and you're pretty much all that I listen to these days. Um, in fact, I picked my 12-year-old son up from school last week and um, he got in the car and I was listening to one of your shows and he goes, oh man, not these guys again. <laughs> so, <laughs> he'll come around though. Um, what I'd like to do is I'll tell you my question and then I'll just give you a little bit of history to explain why this is my question, right? So I think that like the foundation really um, is about like determining the threshold for overtraining, uh, which is a relatively new concept for me. Um, but my question is, is it possible to um, overtrain or train in a high enough volume for an extended period of time that you can sort of become metabolically adapted to that training volume to the extent that going forward, you may require a higher volume of training to get the same results that someone else might get at a lower volume? Mm. So okay. the reason, oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Continue, continue. Cause I, I have a thought, okay. but yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the reason I wonder about this is because I'm, I feel like I've, I've in a, I feel like I've been in a plateau for different reasons for a long time, but, um, I'm 42 years old. I started weightlifting, uh, when I was 33, I joined CrossFit and, um, I totally fell in love with it. I uh, became a big time gym junkie. I was probably training about two hours a day for four to five days a week. And I did that up until 12 months ago. Um, now, 18 months ago, I had a baby um, and uh, I did CrossFit up until the week I delivered. And then I hopped right back into it postpartum. Um, and what CrossFit did really well for me is it kept me lean and it kept me strong. Um, but I, the plateau that I felt like I was in there is that I couldn't uh, put muscle on like I wanted to. So 12 months ago, um, with the goal of putting on muscle and maybe 
uh, you know, just not gaining body fat, right? Um, I transitioned away from like my CrossFit style training and started following more of like a bodybuilding aesthetic type program. So I cut way back on my volume. I learned about overtraining for the first time. And um, as a result, I did cut back on my conditioning significantly. So I now, for the last 12 months, I train four days a week. I train for 75 to 90 minutes. Um, I've also, in the last 12 months, joined NCI. And um, when I started learning more about nutrition, realized that I was way under eating. So I was at like 15 to 1600 calories forever. I reversed up to about 2,200 calories. So that's where I was through this summer. Um, I went into a strength cycle for my training program at 2,200 calories and did also like I was putting on muscle. I was making progress. I hit 220 in my back squat, which is a great PR for me. Hit 155 on my bench press, which was, um, I was real proud of that. Um, so I knew I was like making strides, but then I've been in a hypertrophy cycle since August and I feel like I'm like sliding backwards. So I'm gaining body fat. I feel like I'm losing strength. Um, and I sent some pictures into you guys. I don't know if you have those, but I felt like it was at least a visual of the progression. So like pre-pregnancy and then during pregnancy, six months postpartum, I was in a bikini on the beach and like felt like I had like not quite back gotten back down to where I was pre-pregnancy, but pretty close. And then my current pictures, I'm like the highest amount of body fat that I've ever been. So like I, I sent these into you guys and then I was scrolling through them and I was like, dang, man, I'm like going from like badass to fat ass. I feel like moving <laughs> in the wrong direction um, for the amount of training that I'm doing. So I just want to know, in your opinion, did I, I trained CrossFit for so long in such high volume. Should I be adding more volume to what I'm doing? Do I just need to have more in my workouts than what I'm getting right now to get the results that I'm after? Uh, unlikely. So I'm going to disagree with you on a couple of things. Uh, you're saying to fat ass. First of all, you're you a badass. Right. I'm totally joking about that. Okay, <laughs> I'm totally good. joking. You're still, you're still a badass. And also, do you have some kind of a filter <laughs> on your camera? Did you say you're, you're, you're over 40 and you have a 12-year-old? I have a 12 year old and I have an 18 month old. Oh, Jesus, man. Okay. Yeah. So, at 42. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, you're, whatever you're doing, you're kicking ass, but let's talk about your training. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't want at your, with someone with your training experience and background, at some point, so progressive overload does, is very important for most people, but at some point, it, it's not going to keep working, right? I've been working out for, Almost three decades. It's not linear. Yeah, I, 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 if that were true always, I would be doing you know ten hour workouts seven days a week in order to continue continue progressing. That's just not true. I mean, I just hit a lifetime PR uh, a month or so ago um, at, mm -hmm. at my age, right? So, what you want to think of is not more. That works for a short period of time, like the first couple of years of training. After that, it's different. Think to yourself, different. You've been mm -hmm. doing hypertrophy style bodybuilding style training for a while now. Your body's not responding anymore because it's the, been the same, same training. Stimulus. We got to change it. You got to change it up. So I think you could go more, you know, quote unquote functional. You could go to symmetry, uh, map symmetry, which is unilateral training. You could do powerlifting, a powerlifting style training, which is different than what you're used to. You just got to do different. Don't think more at this point. Now think different. Hey, map strong or performance. That's what comes to mind for yeah. me. I mean, that, that type of training. Also, you, okay, you said you reverse dieted, um, after you reverse dieted, have you kept your calories at 2,200? Have you gone, have you tried to cut for a little bit for so, a while? What have you yeah, done? Yeah, like for the last month, I've gone down. I've tried to cut a little bit because, um, like, I know what it feels like to fit into, not fit into pants because I've squatted too much. Like, I know what that feels like. And now I know what it feels like to not fit into my clothes because I've, like, gained too much around my abdomen, right? Yeah. So I, I cut down, I'm like 1850 to 2000 right now. And I have like, I've lost a little bit, like I've leaned out some, um, but I mean, I can't see my abs right now. And I'm, and that's like, just kind of like, it's sort of a new experience for me because like I said, CrossFit always kept me really lean, yeah. but I was doing a lot of volume too. You, you were doing a lot of volume and your calories were really low. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, you know, I also think that, cause it sounds like you kind of did a, a little bit of bodybuilding, but I, I would even... Because you have a competitive mindset, because you probably have the discipline, and if I was coaching you, I'd like I would love to run like 
like a bodybuilder for a while and try and and tell you don't worry so much about the body fat percentage right now that's we're going to car it'd be all about building your metabolism my goal would be can i get you up to like 2800 calories from you mm -hmm. know these continued inc reverse dieting then small mini cuts then back up to increasing calories and the and the goal would be to get your metabolism all the way up there to put on as minimal body fat as we can during that process and then actually put you in like a cut and really try and lean you out until we have this kind of aesthetic goal that you're trying to achieve and then go to like this functional type training maps performance map strong like that's kind of where I'd want to get your metabolism in an even better place because 2200 is not bad, but it's also not amazing for the amount of activity and training volume that you're doing. Yeah. So you you could be it could a be higher. It could be a lot higher. And you like, know what? Maps aesthetic would be fine because maps aesthetic is phased. So you're probably going to train in rep ranges that you haven't really been training in during this hypertrophy cycle. By the way, I'm going to go on a limb and just ask a couple questions that, that you know might be impactful, might mean nothing, but have you changed anything else during that period of time? You just had a baby. Did you go off birth control, back on birth control? Anything hormonally, sleep? Has anything else changed or has everything else been the same? You know, it's like pretty much been the same. I got, I'm, off, I'm not on birth control. So that's, that's okay. not something that I'm doing. Uh, and that's, and that's why I say like I had a baby. I know that that can impact hormones. Um, I did really well. I felt like with the strength cycle, like the low rep ranges, mm -hmm. the higher weight, I like, I like heavyweight. So that works pretty well for me. Um, but that's, I, I mean, I, other than that, like the training modality is different for me in the last 12 months. And other than that, I mean, nothing else is really much different. And you say this, you're 18 months postpartum. Yep. Did you breastfeed? I did for uh -huh. a for uh, two months. For about two months, and then when you stopped, did you notice a big difference in, in how you felt and all that stuff? No. Okay. So I, I've trained, God, I don't know, probably thirty women pre, during, and then postpartum, and mm -hmm. uh, there's see, there's like a range of like a year to two years when I would train. And these were uh, these were some of them were very active and fit, others were beginners, but I noticed that almost all of them within a year or two postpartum is how long it would take them to feel like, oh, I'm back. My body's totally back. So that's something else to consider, even though okay. you seem to bounce back pretty damn fast. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if if just, you know, another six months from now, you're like, oh, this is now, it feels like my old self and, you know, things are, so that's something else to consider. Um, okay. I, think, I think we're just, we, we've become metabolically adapted to the, amount of like CrossFit type of volume with low calorie for so long. And then you go into a pregnancy and now you're kind of trying to do things the better, healthier way. And it's just kind of taking us a little bit of time right now. I don't think you're in a bad place. I think you're, I think you're definitely hard on yourself. Uh, you probably have that kind of competitive mindset and you want to always be doing better. So I, I think have a little compassion and patient patience. I would be personally, I would be more focused on the metabolism side of this, this, question what do you think reverse diet with maps yeah aesthetic? i mean i just i uh how how can i ask you how tall and how much you weigh right now yeah i'm uh five three um i'm like right around 128 to 130 okay. i i've lost a few pounds uh cutting my calories back some and i would love to get my calories up higher and that was where i'm like how long can i stay in a strength cycle to to boost my metabolism and build muscle before i need to be back in a hypertrophy or switching back into strength i guess i don't know that either oh you know th 3 to 6 weeks but the the reverse diet can go as long as you want you'll interrupt it with periods of like maintenance but mm -hmm. you could stay in a reverse diet uh until you you know kind of hit your targets cuz your calories still are kind of low or they're, they're lower than i would like them to be if you were my client there's always mm -hmm. an individual variance but I think Adam hit the nail on the head. I'd want to see you at like 25 to 2,800 calories for the working out that you're doing and then cut from there. Well, you're almost, so she's in a, a, a Melissa was, is 5'3". So Melissa's 5'3". And this was the last, the last client I ever trained. And she was, a, I trained her for bodybuilding uh -huh. uh, for, for uh, women's uh, physique. And when she got me, when she hired me, she, uh, she was at 1,900 calories. We ended up getting all reverse dieting and training for about almost a year before I prepped her for her first show. I got her all the way up to 2,800 calories. When she got on stage and won, she was 2,200 calories. And that's shredded like, yeah. like unhealthy. And she's five, three. Like, so very kind right. of similar weight, calorie range as you were. Uh, she also trained. She didn't do CrossFit, but she, tra she had trained a lot. And so I had to kind of scale back the intensity 
So it became mm-hmm. really the, when before we prep for the show, that's what I communicate to her. I said, listen, what we're focusing on right now, don't get too hung up on exactly how you look and stuff. I don't obviously want to put on a bunch of body fat, but my goal is to get your calories up really high to a pl- And the, the goal was not a number. It was when she looked at me and said, Adam, I'm eating so much. I can't eat anymore. I go, great. Mm-hmm. We're now we're at a place now where you're having a hard time keeping up yeah. with the calorie goal that I'm giving you. Now's a great place to naturally start to go back the other direction. Hopefully we land in a place that you are very comfortable eating and can maintain. So uh, to me, and, and also keep in mind too, kind of what Sal was saying before earlier that, I mean, you look awesome and you've built a lot of good muscle and you've trained your ass off pretty hard for a while. Like you're, you're starting to head towards the upper echelon of like muscle that you probably are are naturally can build to your physique like at at one point that really starts to slow down like he said earlier like yeah your lifts are really i mean those are impressive lifts. yeah you're you're strong as shit you look good like yeah i mean i think i think we're in a pretty good place i just think that the the focus should be more metabolically like that should be slow and steady yep slow and steady and get it up there and a huge win for you and i if you were a client would be like in six months from now we're eating a sick and i don't really care what you look like as long as we didn't get way worse than where you're at right now you don't keep putting on tons of body fat but that you're eating a significant amount more calories and feeling good and then going like okay now let's let's go for a little bit of a cut let's send do you have maps aesthetic jennifer no, I just got anabolic because I didn't, I've read through all your plans. I didn't know what to do. So I actually did my first anabolic workout this week, um, but I looked at aesthetic and I, that was one that I considered. Would that be the best plan for me well, to go with? Yeah, you, yeah, no. yeah, I wouldn't mind her running an anabolic yeah, since, now you, you, say since that. you haven't done it yet. Why don't you run that and, and wh- do the three foundational workouts a week and then make sure to do all the trigger sessions on the off days. Okay. With your yep. level of experience after that, go to maps aesthetic. We'll send you, okay. we'll send you maps instead. And, and my goal would be to, on the nutrition side is to be, you know, keeping you in a calorie surplus surplus for at least, you know, three to six weeks at a time. And then okay. what would make me go back the other way. And by the way, this will be challenging because we kind of mess with ourselves psychologically. Like, you know, really be some, like, do not allow just a little bit of water retention or a little bit of weight, really keep pushing yeah. the calories until you're like, okay, I'm definitely starting to put on more than I like. Now I'm going to cut for a week maybe two weeks okay. and then go back to the the increase again and kind of play that back and forth of a surplus uh, and, a, and a deficit, but more often in a surplus trying to build the metabolism up. Yeah. Do I do any cardio with that? Do I do any, or am I like just following the programming? Cause I'm fine with that. And really I'm fine with adding some body fat, like mass moves mass. I know when I weigh more, I lift more. Yeah. Um, and I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure that I'm not putting myself into like a rabbit hole that I have a hard time digging myself walks. out of. Yeah, I would do walks. walks. I just, just, yeah, like, like, you know, uh, three walks a day, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 15 minutes after each one. That's like 45 minutes of walking. If you like cardio and you want to do it for health, there's nothing wrong with doing a few, a few sessions a week. But if you just like want to maximize what you're trying to do right now, I would just focus on steps throughout I mean, the day. Typically what I do with someone like this, if you were already like running a certain amount in the week, I normally just replace that with walks. I just go like, okay, if you were going for a, you know, three days a week or four days a week, you were going for a, you know, a couple mile run or whatever. I say, okay, well now that time frame, just switch it to a walk back off the intensity. That's what, what I don't want to do is you know, send this endurance signal while I'm also trying to speed your me- metabolism up because it's a conflicting message, right? Like right. You're, if you're pushing endurance and intensity in cardio, right? While, while we're also trying to reverse diet, it's kind of conflicting. So I wouldn't necessarily want you to eliminate that if you were doing that frequently during the week. I would just want to exchange it from running an intense type of cardio to something that is more recuperative like walking. Awesome. Okay, cool. right. I'll do that. Well, thanks for calling and in, then, Jennifer. Let's. Thank I'm gonna. You. I'm gonna have Doug throw you in the forum too. So I. I, I love to hear. Oh, thank you. The process. I would love doing. that. Yeah, and then just you know, yeah, keep us updated every you know month or so. Check in with us, tag us in the forum, and let us know. Uh, you know, if you're having any challenges or what you're noticing and seeing, and then we can kind of help adjust as you go. I will. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Jennifer. Yeah, she and De- I'm glad you said don't be so hard on yourself. I mean, yeah, she looks awesome and I, she's strong. First as of all, if she didn't say her age, I would have been like you're 32. Mm-hmm. So whatever she's doing is working really well. Yeah, and she's got a baby at home. But no, that's great. That's great advice, and I'm glad we had someone ask a question like that because it is true that your body will adapt to your current volume and more volume and more training will get you to move further. But it's only true to a certain point. That's at right. some that's, point, that's it the stops. trap. That's the trap. Yes. Right? Is that you think you have to do that? And I really think what she's experiencing is that 
she went so hard and did so well at CrossFit for for so long that this is just kind of her kind of going back. Now she's trying to get better, yeah. more balanced, and so it's going to take a little bit. It's not going to be as fast, you know. Mm. So our next caller is Carlos from Texas. Carlos, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, uh, hey guys, how, how y'all doing? I hope y'all doing okay. I'm doing good, man. We are. All right. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for all of the information that y'all provide. Um, with y'all's information, I'm 55 years old and I'm in the best shape of my life. And, uh, I owe a lot of that to y'all. So, uh, I want to tell y'all that, that I'm very appreciative uh, of that. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Also, um, not just your fitness information. Uh, the other day I was having a conversation with one of my coworkers and, uh, they were telling me, uh, how ugly a person I was. And I told him, well, that's a direct correlation with testicle size. I said, we can go back to the mind pump show and I will prove that to y'all. And, uh, so, so I appreciate all of the other yeah. information y'all give me too. Um, anyway. So Wait, that guy is a, he's a very handsome guy. So what does that that's tell you it. about yeah. him? <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, you, uh, you win yeah. today. Now, I, I have a uh, pretty simple question. Yeah. Uh, from time to time, I would do a prolonged fast. Um, and I would like to know um, how y'all adjust y'all's training on the days that y'all do those prolonged uh, fast. How long is um, prolonged? And I'd also like to know how you in reintroduce food once you are done with your fast. How, and how I'd also like to get um, Doug's input on that because he's closer to my age. Okay. So, yeah. Mm. Um, well, just so any advice would help, uh, be appreciated. Well, just so you know, Carlos, he may be chrono chronologically closer to your age, but he's way younger than we are. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> hey, Carlos, how long is prolonged? You said prolonged fast. What are we talking? Day, multiple yeah, my, days? My fast usually Day lasts hour. for 36 to 40 hours or so. Okay. okay. I might go for 48. Okay. Um, but I usually don't go longer than that. Okay. You're okay. not, you're not working out on those days. Yeah. How frequently are you doing these? Well, so I do my fast for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, and so whenever I do one of these fasts, um, I, I may do it once a week for a while. And I say a while for, for four weeks, six weeks or so. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and then after that, I, you know, I'll, I'll stop and go back to my regular routine. Take, I would take the day off. I, would, I mean, and you I, honestly, you've already replaced it probably with what the idea of the fast is, you know, a spiritual practice. I think that um, I'd be more focused on internal work on the days of fasting. So my relationship with my wife and kids, uh, how am I growing as a person? What are things I need? Where can I, be? you know, like to me, when you're in that fasted state, you're already training the rest of the week and you're consistent. This is the day you're not eating any food. This is the day. It's a spiritual practice for you. I'm going to do my internal work on that day more than anything else. That doesn't mean you can't do, you know, yoga or mobility yeah. or a good, nice hike. Like you could definitely include movement and uh, some physical activity, but I'm not weight training that day. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about going to hit the gym. This is me personally. This is how I address it. This is my time to work internally on myself and that at most will include walking or mobility. Other than that, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm focused yeah, more it, internal. It's not beneficial to work out on those days anyway. It, it's, uh, it, you, you know, fasting for eight hours, 10 hours, not a big deal. Once you get past 24 hours, probably not a good idea to have intense, uh, changes completely. intense workouts. Yeah. And then on those weeks, cause you did mention you'll do like four weeks in a row, the other workouts you would just judge based on how you felt. Okay, so you might need to reduce intensity. You might not. Just base it on on how you feel. And then as far as what to reintroduce uh, when you do eat again, uh, very well cooked vegetables, easy to digest proteins, bone and broth. It, yeah, and it's a small meal. It's us I usually if I do a fast for forty eight or more hours, I'll have two or three small meals before I have a regular meal. And I've experimented with this, and that seems to work the best. If I introduce a bit like a normal size meal too early. It uh, doesn't feel very good. Okay. All right. Very good. And and one other part of this uh, same scenario, um, going into the fast, um, what would you recommend as far as um, what to eat uh, or is there, you know, should I just treat it like a normal day? Normally I'll stop eating around six o'clock and uh, should I try to add another meal after that? 
on the day going into a fast or would you just treat it like a normal day? Normal day. I, I, yeah, I would yeah, treat it like a normal day. day. You're doing it for spiritual reasons. I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for calling All in, right. man. Very good, guys. I appreciate y'all. Like I said, thank you for everything y'all do, man. I, it, it, it's, it's helped me out tremendously. You're the man, Carlos. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, the, the problem, you and your, I think you and your the, big balls. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's a study that I, I, I pulled up where they correlated. I forgot about that. Testicle dude. size. To I, had no, I had no idea where he was going. I know. And yeah. so that caught me off guard. That was really good. I know. So the more handsome you are, the smaller. Yeah, you I was like, yeah. is he talking about like small taints? Yeah, like, I didn't know for- that study. I yeah. forgot oh, yeah. about That's that funny. one. You know what? He, of all the fasting questions we've got, I think he's the first person to say he's doing it for spiritual reasons, which is really the valuable. That's the most right. valuable reason to do them but um but yeah and even if you're not a by the way if you're listening and you're not a spiritual person and you're agnostic or atheist or what that too i still think that i would use that as my time to do internal work like that's what it is self-reflection so, yeah, yeah self-reflection and yep. what are other things my relationships with my family and friends so you don't need to be this detachment godly yeah. person be- to do prolonged fast for quote-unquote spiritual right. reasons there's plenty of other things that you can do that i think will benefit you and i think that is supports your overall health journey, right? Totally. Yeah. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of weak points and and areas that I struggled with developing for a a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 